Yeah, many thanks for the introduction. We get right into the middle of my topic. Uh, I start with the with a citation of uh, August Bibel. He's a German social democrat living in the essentially in the second half of the 19th century. I think he died in 19 in 1913 or something. And he said, "Only those who know the past can understand the present and shape the future." And I will also give an, an anecdote from my first field trip last year on a subalpine pasture. I was lying in the tent in the morning and you know that entomologists get up late and I was still lying in my tent at nine o'clock and the insects were buzzing and humming like, like in my childhood and it was so loud that it sounded like a distant motorway. So uh, that subalpine pasture apparently uh, held uh, masses of insects and they were really, really loud. I would like to start with an with a historical clock of the Central European landscape. And this clock starts about 8,000 years ago on the left hand uh, uh, top row. Do you see my mouse moving, Simon? Yes, 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 we can see it. Okay, <clears throat> so this clock starts at, at uh, 12 o'clock at midnight <clears throat> at the onset of the, neo of the Neolithic. Uh, and then the pointers go round and we have uh, we are in the middle of the afternoon at 3:36, and this is when the Iron Age starts. And this is the earliest uh, the earliest period when uh, scythes and sickles were uh, were used for cutting grass and for cutting wood. This is about 2,800 years before present. At 6 o'clock p.m., uh, the Roman Age uh, starts. At that time, we have two crop rotation. We have the earliest meadows. And this is about 2,000 years ago. At 9.18, in the middle of the, of the evening, we have the onset of meadow cultivation in the 12th century. At that time, um, river valleys were cultivated. They were irrigated with water. And uh, at that time, larger patches of meadows were created. Well, larger is a bit exaggerated. It was just the, the valley bottom and uh, altogether not very large, and uh, otherwise meadows were very rare. And most of the winter fodder for the cattle was uh, actually was taken from, from trees, but not from meadows. <clears throat> and then at 11.24, something important is going on. At that time, in many parts of Europe, the common pastures, which were very widespread until then, they were enclosed. This means they, uh, people divided these pastures, divided this common land to, to farmers. And that was the time when, when most fences uh, came up. <clears throat> and this also happened in, in, in woodland, not only in open pastures. Uh, and until then, much of the European woodland was also grazed by large animals. At that time also, uh, the clover was, was cultivated. Clover was, was uh, planted on uh, on the in, in that kind of three crop rotation they had and this was the first time when when humans were were capable of putting aerial nitrogen into the system into their agricultural system <clears throat> and much of the cattle was moved indoor at that time and this was about 200 or 220 years ago at the turn of the uh, 18th to the 19th century then a bit later 11 33, this was in, in Germany. Maybe this cannot be generalized. This was the onset of the straw meadow cultivation. Straw meadows now are, are, is a type of meadow which is extremely rich in, in uh, plants and also uh, insects. And they used the, the grass. It is rather wet meadows. And the grass was cut only once a year in late summer or in autumn. And this grass, this hay, was, was used for, for as a straw substitute, actually, in the stables for the cattle. And then at 1151, the, the, the post-war intensification started uh, around 1950. This was actually the time when, when the older among us, well, not among us probably, but our fathers and grandfathers, at their earliest memories. And this was the time when the, when the first small tractors were bought and when the early mechanization of our landscape started. <clears throat> and then three minutes to 12, uh, about 
1980, this was the time when modern agriculture started, modern industrial agriculture, and also modern conservation management started. So we can see that in the top row, in these uh, four sections, in the in the in sorry, in the bottom row, uh, very important things happened. And uh, if we if we extend this clock, if we draw this clock to a longitudinal bar, we can see that on the left hand side, from the onset of to the Neolithic, to the Iron Age, and so on, uh, there was nothing nothing much that happened, but that in the very last period there is a concentration of very important events and um, this happened only in about 70, 70 years but our conceptions for the conservation of biodiversity and cultural landscapes explicitly refer on traditional land use so we always want to to imitate traditional land use when we when we make management but uh, this is based in fact only on the very short period of these last uh, seven years, actually, uh, the post-war period. What we neglect is is actually 99% of the history, of the total history of our uh, cultural landscape as a whole. And this, these 99% are mainly made up by grazing cattle, by horses, by sheep and pigs. So this was how, how the landscape looked through most of the time. It was uh, a semi-open landscape, grassland with a few uh, trees and, and, and shrubs, uh, sometimes a bit more, but in general it was mostly open. And it was controlled and shaped mostly by grazing animals. <clears throat> and this is where the cultural heritage of our biodiversity comes from. It is from this grazed landscape uh, by our cattle and horses, mostly. Now we do the following. We compress these 8,000 years of cultural landscape history to that red bar on the right-hand side. This is 8,000 years now of cultural history. And we put it into the context of the Pleistocene, 2.6 million years on this bar. And well, we could also go back further into the, into the, the tertiary. We can, we can go back more than 20 million years, actually. And what happened at these, during this time? It was these huge uh, fellows who, who were there and who were not controlled by, by, uh, by humans who shot them or killed them. So uh, we can state that there was a coexistence or even a coevolution of all our terrestrial biota, plants and animals and, 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 and fungi with large herbivores through many millions of years. And on the other hand, we have a large scale mowing for only 200 years, but this large scale mowing covers nearly 100% of our grassland area, uh, including post grazing mowing, rolling, baling, and other stuff we do with our machines. So um, the, the controlling factors for our landscape are now totally different than they were uh, before. So we can state that, that there are about 200 years of, of uh, machine, of machines, of, of mowing versus 20 million or even more years of grazing. So this is a factor of, of 100,000 times more that our landscape has been grazed uh, compared to mown. And there were not only these large uh, uh, elephants and rhinos and, 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 and so on, there, were also, there was also musk oxen, there were several species of bison, there was border buffalo, there was even uh, hippos, and bears and a, a variety of large cats that uh, were predators and who lived on on these large uh, herbivores. And from this time, from these more than 20 million years, uh, comes the natural heritage of our of our biodiversity. This is from a paper from uh, Chris Swenning from the Aarhus University in in Denmark, and he made for a better visualization of what I'm saying. He made uh, 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 a picture and showing on the left hand side the the mammals on earth uh, of today the recent mammals and on the right hand side the situation about 50,000 years ago before man uh, was more active by hunting and, and other stuff and 
The two pictures on the top are those herbivores over a thousand kilograms, and you can readily see that, uh, that the recent situation shows that there are only a few species left in Africa, in the southern half of Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, but that the rest of the world is completely free of these large animals. But 50,000 years ago, the most, uh, the highest diversity of these large fellows was not in Africa as it is today, but in South America and also in North America and also in, in Europe, there were many species and even more species than in most parts of Africa. And a very similar picture, we get a similar, very similar picture for the, the size class of 45 to 1000 kilograms and also for the carnivores. So uh, 50,000 years ago, there was a huge, a huge uh, number of, of mammals uh, which have all become extinct. Nowadays, the situation has quite decreased for most of them. So this is how we can imagine uh, the landscape at that time. Uh, not all of these pictures are taken from Africa, only top left and uh, bottom right. These other two pictures, pictures are actually taken from, from uh, the only uh, Central European place where herbivores are not controlled by man. This is both taken from, from Ostbaders Plassen, uh, uh, an area in the Netherlands where there are uh, red deer and uh, our oxen, well, the, 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 the uh, re, uh, the, the, the uh, hackred, uh, and also uh, wild horses are kept there and they control the vegetation. And you can see that there is on the upper right picture, there is there are only very few trees in the background and very similar uh, top left. Uh, there is not a closed forest and the area is open. So we can distinguish between three periods that shaped our landscape. On the left hand side, there is the wild mega herbivores that shaped the landscape between the tertiary and the um, until the Mesolithic. So about 20 million years ago. And then there was a period which we would uh, call the, the cultural uh, landscape history, reaching from the Neolithic bis until, until the early industrial age, about 8,000 years, when domesticated cattle and, and uh, um, animals pulling the plow and pulling the cart uh, made the landscape. And then um, for about 100 years, we have the machines and they, make, they create a quite different landscape than the landscapes before. And this is also the time when our diversity decreased substantially. So a short uh, summary about what I said uh, until then. In the beginning, there was pasture. And all our recent biodiversity comes from this pasture. The pasture is the biotic mother of mown meadows, including straw meadows. It is the mother of forests, of orchards, of parks, of gardens, of fields. But today, this pasture has been plowed it has been identified or it is being mown. But grazing is a key factor for biodiversity. And grazed landscapes are a kind of, of balsam for our stressed urban souls. So in our holidays, we go to the Alps, we go to the Estremadura in central Spain, we go to the Camargue in southern France, to the Pusta area of, of, uh, of Hungary, we go to Mongolia, Africa. We are searching that kind of Arcadia that is that we have been that we destroyed in the last hundred years. So this is a picture of of, the, of this kind of, of of Arcadia, drawn in 1839. Uh, you can find uh, on the web you can find hundreds or even thousands of pictures like this of these uh, painters of the 19th century who who made uh, fantastic uh, who were fantastic witnesses of the landscape at that time. And this is a view on Munich. From, from, a, from a place, from a, uh, from a village outside of Munich. And you can see the Alps in the background. And you can see in the middle part of, it, of this village, you can see the, the unregulated uh, Isar uh, River. And you can see cows uh, uh, crossing this river. And you can see, you can see these two uh, women uh, taking their cattle, their, their cow and their goats and their sheep home. And if you look exactly, there is on this, this small uh, patch, if you magnify this, 
uh, this picture, you would probably see or sub or or uh, assume that this is a red back shrike or something. That small bird here, which is now quite rare in our in our recent landscape. And this is a picture from the surroundings of Nuremberg. Actually, the same cows and and sheep and cattle uh, being taken home by the herders. And you can see these these trees, which are shaped also by the animals, because much of this of the of the twigs are taken home uh, not for for making uh, baskets but also for feeding as a winter fodder for the cattle so i would say that grazing is a key factor for the shape for the shaping of the landscapes and i would propagate uh, new pastures but not this kind of pasture this is what we see nowadays in many parts of germany and also in many parts in many other parts of europe uh, and this is a paddock with with 50 or 100 sheep covering maybe an, an hectare or something, not more. And uh, the sheep are kept there until really the last stem of grass is, is eaten. And all that remains is the dung, uh, but not a single flower. I promote this kind of pasture. This is from Romania. And you see that it's not sheep, it's cattle. And the cattle is, is kept at a very uh, low density and you can see flowers in, in a variety of colors. You can see shrubs and some patches of woodland. And this is the real biodiversity that we need in our landscape. Concerning the, the, the numbers of different grazing animals, uh, we often, we often, I often meet people who assume that, that the sheep is has always been the most important grazing animal but this is apparently not true these are numbers these are livestock numbers in germany in the time between 1800 to 1950 in millions and you can really indeed you can see that the sheep this line uh, is is top but you can also see that there is a maximum between 1830 and about 1800 and 80 and this was a time when when uh, germany and perhaps other uh, european countries <clears throat> were uh, were exporting lots of uh, wool uh, all over the world and then there was a crisis and there was there were uh, synthetic synthetic fibers and there was also the imported uh, wool from new zealand that broke this market and from then onwards the sheep decreased dramatically in europe uh, these are cattle this blue line are cattle, and you can see that the sheep the, the, the sheep line is mostly uh, above the cattle. But if we consider that a uh, that a cow is probably about ten times as heavy as a sheep, and if we transform this um, into biomass, then we could state that uh, compared to the sheep, the impact of the cattle on the landscape is probably ten to twenty times stronger. So. Uh, these cattle simply ate more, they grazed more, and they had a stronger impact on the shape of the landscape until the beginning of the industrial age. This is a graph from uh, a time before, from the Roman age in uh, central Germany, in Thuringia. And these are bone, uh, bone remnants in, in, uh, in, settle, in deposits of settlements, of, of uh, farmers or farmer villages <clears throat> and you can see that the cattle bones are most uh, uh, are most common and after the cattle there is the pig and the sheep and the goat bones which cannot be distinguished uh, play only a smaller role these are five different villages in thuringia so this is apparently a constant pattern and this goes also through several through more periods than only the roman and the pre-industrial age uh, this is a, 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 an example of our perception today. This is a, xero, a xerothermic site in, in Thuringia, which is nowadays grazed by sheep. And uh, everybody, every conservationist or every nature lover whom you would ask there would say that the sheep is the traditional, the traditional animal at this place. But there is uh, an old photograph in an actually quite famous book from Ellenberg who wrote a book about the vegetation of Central Europe. And this photograph is, was taken in the 1930s. And you can see these, these cattle tracks, which in these parallel lines, it is quite typical for, for cattle. Sheeps, sheep never make these kind of tracks. So uh, 90 years ago, the cattle was also there, but they, are, they were put 
indoors now and people nowadays believe that the sheep were always uh, the the most important grazing animals on these places and this is a photograph from axerothermic limestone plateau of the the franconian jura in southern germany also a place where you can see only sheep today but in 1915 uh, there were there were uh, uh, cattle taken out by the local herder and the local herder of course nowadays he works somewhere in a factory or does something else uh, but he's no more a herder anymore because the cattle are indoors now this is quite a famous book in german which describes the the this kind of economy at that time um, it's probably not available in other languages so i go further and I ask the question what made this kind of old landscape species rich? And the very, the very first point, perhaps the most important point, is the dung. The dung, which is nowadays, uh, which falls nowadays uh, in the stable and no more outside, we can say that that one cow produces approximately ten tons per year. Uh, and this, these ten tons could be uh, could could make up about 100 kilograms of insects and about 10 or 50 kilograms of birds, bats, and other vertebrates. This could be a bastard, um, Otis. Um, I, don't the, I don't know the Czech word in German, it's Trappe. It could be three storks, it could be 300 larks, it could be 125 starlings, 200 common frogs, and many other vertebrates. So this is a huge, a huge uh, biomass that could be produced by a single cow within one year alone. And you can also see that the dung is not only taken by or eaten by beetles, but also by butterflies and, of course, uh, numerous flies. And this is a bird list, unfortunately only in German, uh, a bird list of species which eat uh, dung beetles. And it's incredibly long. It covers um, 150 species or so. It includes a uh, goshawk, it includes red kite, milvus milvus. It includes uh, uh, lesser, lesser, what's that eagle? Uh, Aquila, Aquila pomarina, uh, common buzzard, uh, hobby. It includes owls, it includes uh, bee eaters, hoopoe, of course. It includes uh, our horn, this is the, the capercaillie, uh, and many other birds. And also many, any, many other, uh, many mammals like badger, fox, and hedgehog, and so on. So these. Uh, dung beetles and other dung insects are a huge source of food and and this source of food is predictable. So imagine we have a, a period in mid-May when all these birds are breeding and and you know that in mid-May we often have a cold period lasting 10 days or so when we even have frost sometimes and there are no insects anymore. So if there is if there are uh, hundreds of, of patches of cow dung in the landscape the birds just need to hop out of their nest, hop down to that uh, to such a, a cow pad, and take up the insects and go back to their nest and breed and continue breeding or continue warming their their chicks, and they would not die. This is now the cow pad of the third millennium. It is actually nothing but a toxic waste. These cow pads are actually well poisoned through ivermectin and and similar stuff, which controls or or kills uh, parasites. This is what most animals, most cattle, get nowadays uh, 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 permanently. And also the slurry that can't be used by insects during due to its structure and uh, due to its content and timing. So the cow dung now is lost <clears throat> for the nutrition of insects. <clears throat> what else made this old landscape species rich? <clears throat> it is just the the mechanical impact of the, the of the animals. Uh, they make these these tracks. Uh, in German, we say Holweg, kind of of hollow of hollow roads. Uh, you can imagine that there can birds can breed here, or a number of beetles or wild bees. They want these open structures, and they can breed here, and they find they can warm up themselves when it's cold otherwise, and so on. And there are also these kinds of, of, of wallows here, made here by a horse, for instance, or this kind of, of huge dung piles, which are actually made by, by rhinos, but also of horses along the borders of their territories. So where, where, uh, where uh, 
territories of two stallions uh, come together, they make these these large piles of dung. And you, you can imagine, for instance, that there could be there could be uh, snakes breeding in these in these dung piles. And I think in India there are species that that do that breeding in these uh, piles of dung piles of rhinos. There are these kind of, of foot tracks, you know, which can be can become filled by water, and where there are where there are uh, butterflies, or here in this track of a of a cow, uh, my son uh, took out that small uh, yellow uh, red bellied uh, red belly toad in in Croatia. Or there are these these small ponds. Nowadays our landscape doesn't need any uh, ponds anymore. Uh, formerly, these ponds were were needed for for the water for watering the the uh, the cattle, and these ponds were of course uh, habitats for for amphibians and for insects and for many other uh, plants and animals. But mainly in the 50s and in the 60s, these ponds were were destroyed. They were filled up, and nowadays they are gone. There are also thistles, which do no more exist on mown meadows because they cannot regrow so quickly, but they exist on, on pastures. And these, these individuals I, I photographed here, they are almost two meters high. And you can imagine that there are loads of, of butterflies, of bugs, of beetles, and any other uh, insects around them. And in winter, uh, the linnet and the goldfinch would come and take the seeds and uh, there are many specialized insects living on them, and you would nowhere find these on a mown meadow. Well, there are other uh, flowers. Sorry that this uh, I couldn't get this uh, slide in, in, in English. Uh, <clears throat> there is, for instance, this group, Gensiana in, in, in German. Um, those who know plants know that these contain uh, bitter, bitter ingredients so that the uh, grazing animals would not eat it. These are orchids. This is uh, Dictamnus albus. Most of these flowering plants, they have ingredients which are bitter or even poisonous, and they would not be eaten, except uh, the stocking densities are too high. So on a near natural pasture, uh, no animal would eat these plants. And they can bloom and flower, and, and they can also regrow. And Another structure, another plant uh, structure, which you would not find on mown meadows, is these kind of tassocks, or this kind of what we call, I don't know the English word, in German it's Geistelle. It's the place where there was a, a, a cow pet, and where, where cows do not eat for quite some time. And this is the place where nettles grow and where small shrubs grow. And in the protective zone of these small shrubs, there can other uh, flowers grow, and even small trees can grow, or even oaks, for instance, can regrow in these patches. And this is also the, the, the patches where birds breed, for instance, and where birds are comparatively safe from uh, predators. This is a kind of what we call in German a Kuh bush. This is a slow, a slow bush, which has been, which is uh, on, a, on a pasture in central Germany, and you can see this, this special structure, and well, it is a kind of aesthetics which you would not, which you, which you would not meet in on a mown meadow. And of course, this is a, a, a great place for breeding shrikes and buntings and, and other birds. And you also have these these huge old trees, uh, which, for instance, are are <laughs> are treated by these by these pigs. In, on a on a, an open pasture on a pig pasture in Croatia, you can see uh, the tracks of, of large beetles here in this oak. It is small patches of paradise which you don't find anymore in our landscape. So this is the good pas the good pasture, and it has a third dimension, a dimension that is more than than uh, than length and breadth. It goes out. It, it goes up from from uh, from the soil. But what happens if we mow this third dimension? We get this, and all the diversity is gone, and we don't need this uh, pond anymore. We can destroy it, we can fill it up, and after 20 years, it is just flat, and nothing would remain from our diversity we had uh, uh, some decades ago. 
This is now a situation we can find even in a German national park. I'm honest, this is a, a picture from a German national park. It is mown and it's, it's grazed by sheep. And after the sheep grazing, they mow once more in autumn so that everything becomes smooth. Uh, it is, this is not what I, is, this is not the conception of biodiversity that I have. And if you come next to a forest edge, we get this picture. Uh, this is a, a planted forest and there is no margin. And uh, even also here, we would not find much biodiversity. This is a margin I would uh, promote, uh, but mowing does not allow such structures. What else made our old landscape species rich? It is just the, the absence of mowing. This paper, this is a, a table taken from a review by, by Jean-Yves Hubert. He's from the, uh, I think, Bern University in Switzerland. And he took, he brought together uh, all uh, papers about mowing worldwide. And he stated that the mortalities of all studied groups, ranging from, from turtles to, to mice and frogs and grasshoppers and leafhoppers and beetles and bees, um, that mortality ranges between 5 and 80% per single cut. So every cut reduces the existing insect fauna or fauna in general uh, between 5 and 80%. So this is dramatic actually. And uh, to show the effect, I drew the phenologies of, of a variety of insects onto such a graph. <clears throat> so every line is a phenology of a certain group of insects. For instance, here we have, uh, we have a species that has two generations. And the first generation has a peak in, in spring and the second one in summer. And the next graph, for instance, has a single generation uh, peaking in high summer. And this one has a single generation peaking in late summer. And here again, we have a a two, a bivoltine species, which is a bit later. You have a variety of phenologies, and each of these uh, curves represents probably hundreds of species of insects. So, what happens if you mow? If you mow, uh, you reduce the, the the whole resource, the whole living living resource of these insects dramatically, and this would lead to a decrease of these curves of abundance uh, quite down. And maybe this later a generation could recover a bit <clears throat> when, when we mow our meadows look our meadows look like this so we get these depressed curves and if we postpone mowing postponing mowing is uh, is a mode that has been which they 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 did a lot of research about postponing mowing uh, in order to to protect some groups of insects those earlier groups or maybe to protect some some special groups of, of early flowering plants. Uh, if you postpone that mowing, we make a problem for these later uh, uh, phenologies. And the same happens when we postpone mowing until autumn. Uh, this would lead to an effect that goes to the next year. But now we start again with mowing. So eventually we cause an accumulating drain of our, of our biodiversity through mowing for at least 200 years. And so, uh, in the meantime, the meadow, the modern meadow, has turned into a trap that sucks migrating insects out of the landscape. This is what many of our, of our modern meadows, which are cut three or four or five times, have turned into. And for, for uh, demonstrating uh, the effect also on amphibians. I like to present you a story that was written by by this man, Heinz Rangno. Nobody knows him. He wrote a book in 1934, uh, about 15 years as well. He calls he calls it 15 Jahre Waldläufer, 15 years of of a forest ranger or something. And I would like to uh, translate it for you: endless meadows. Formerly the most frog rich in our country are nowadays entirely devoid of them. Since mowing machines are being used, during the early years of their introduction, of the introduction of these machines, 
Mowing was often very tough because of the mass of frogs squeezed between the blades. Almost every 20 meters, the machines had to be stopped in order to remove the massacred frogs. A terrible view for every nature lover. Nowadays, and nowadays means in that book, 1934. Nowadays, this would not happen anymore, just because there are no more frogs. So this man was the witness of these early mowing machines. And we can state that even the, the first wave of mechanization of mowing in the 1920s has probably largely eradicated frogs, snakes, and many other large animals from much of our mown grassland. Nowadays, we would, we would be happy to meet a farmer who would use such a thing, yeah? but still it was the, the major killer of uh, frogs and snakes in the, in the early last century. We come back to our pasture. What made the old pasture species rich? It was this kind of, of grazed swords. Um, we had a sword that was continuously, uh, continuously grazed all through the season, and there was a continuous and highly diverse range of flowers. And you can also see some orchids, in this case, uh, Orchis ustulata, which is quite rare in Germany, which grows on these cattle pastures. And going 10 meters further, you would see a totally different aspect. And further 10 meters, it would see, it would look again different, so that the beta diversity on these grazed swords is extremely high. Although a botanist found that uh, the, the, the floristic uh, wealth of species is highest in mown meadows, uh, this might be true for, for, the, for the scale of a square meter, but not for the scale, for a large scale, uh, what I'm showing here. And if you imagine that you have these uh, vertical structures uh, on these pastures, you can imagine that there, there must be an, an, a huge diversity of bees, for instance, and other insects which need these open structures plus the flowers. There is also another point which is, no, which is almost forgotten nowadays. It is zoochore. Zoochore is the dispersal of of plant seeds and also of even of small animals and other uh, uh, structures by large animals. And this factor alone is, could be uh, important for the decline of meadow biodiversity because uh, the turnover of seeds and, and of, of whole populations is no more given in our modern meadows. This is, for instance, a, a fallow that, that I found in Romania and it is, a, it is probably on a former patch of free crop rotation, you can see this endless variety of flowers. And the only way that the seeds have, uh, might have come there is through the stomachs of, of cattle, which roam there all the time. So now I'm coming to leaf hoppers and plant hoppers. This is actually my, my favorite group, and I would not uh, give a talk without mentioning these. Just a few. Uh, a few um, uh, strategies of them or a few uh, uh, properties. They are actually ubiquitous in our landscape. You can really say that, you can really state that they are in all types of, of terrestrial landscape. You can really, you can really call it a cicatosphere uh, with abundances of over 5,000 individuals per square meter. And we have a very high specificity of host plants and also habitats. And perhaps the most interesting thing is a site precision. They are they keep to their plant. They actually don't probably don't move away for for only a few centimeters because they 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 hatch from the egg, and the egg would most of the the, the larvae would not leave their their uh, their host plant, except for a few species which are definitely known as migrating species. They are long-winged and they, it belongs to their life strategy that they migrate. But the majority, the majority of species would be very, very uh, stable on their place, on their patch. We have a large species number, but this species number is still manageable. We have about uh, 600 species in the Czech Republic, about 650 in Germany or Austria, and we can 
uh, sample them in a standardized way and we can make statistical comparisons. Uh, for instance, with such a suction sampler, you can sweep them. All these small dots are leaf hoppers, and then you take them out with that uh, aspirator, and this is how such a catch uh, would look like. Now I present a case study one. This is approximately the, the species number, about 200, more than 200 species that I found on a small patch of historical a grazing landscape in Germany. Only on six hectare, I found a 208 species. This is almost a third of the total species number all over Germany, which I found on, on six football grounds uh, in that, in that uh, historical grazing landscape. So an enormous uh, number of, of species. And I, I contacted several colleagues who work in, in tropical in tropical forest, in evergreen tropical forest, and they they responded that uh, on such a small scale of six hectares, they would not have more species in tropical in tropical forests. They would probably have more uh, species on on a larger scale, on larger uh, patches, but not on six hectares. So this is an absolutely fantastic diversity within Central Europe in such a grazed patch. And if you compare. Uh, about 100, more than 100 meadows, uh, conventional meadows, I studied in many parts of Germany. And it is not, uh, not conventional meadows, but it is, it is meadows that, that are under conservation contracts with farmers. And where farmers are paid for uh, in order to conserve diversity. This is the, the, the average number of leafhoppers I found in these, uh, in these contract meadows about 10 to 15 uh, in numerous places in Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, Lower Saxony, and even in high nature, in high quality nature reserves like the central Kaiserstuhl, um, grassland is mown and the biodiversity is decreased dramatically. And this is what you find on, on normal flower strips, zero to eight species, and probably some of these species would not even reproduce Maybe there are only zero to four species which would reproduce on these flower strips. And for, for less mobile insect groups like the, like the leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, these flower strips might actually act as ecological traps. This is an, an ordination taken from an earlier a paper of mine showing the, uh, the leaf hopper diversity on, uh, on meadows, on conservation meadows, on intensively used meadows, on fallows, and on extensive pastures. What you can see here is that extensive pastures and fallows uh, cover a very wide range, but that uh, uh, extensive and intensive meadows cover only a very small range. This indicates that, the, the, that a wide variety or a wide natural diversity of this of this of this uh, landscape is is compressed to a very low level on these meadows and the interesting thing is that there is no difference between uh, extensive meadows and intensive meadows but there is a large uh, diversity on um, on extensive pastures and also on fallows which are not mown at all this is a very similar picture uh, from a study about plants on year-round pastures comprised here by the, by the, by the red line. Uh, and again, we have, as a comparison, we have meadows, <coughs> frequently cut meadows, which cover only a very small uh, range of, um, of this diversity. So this could be a general picture, which is also valid for other groups. And if we, if we look at these species more closely, this is again the 208 species of, of leafhoppers on that historically, uh, historical old landscape. On the left axis, the total species number, and on the right hand axis, the, the number of red list species. You can see that it's especially the, the red list species, and also here, the, the more specialized species, which are 
uh, more abundant uh, in this old grazing landscape. So it is uh, the more important the more important species for conservation that we can protect with this kind of, of uh, land management. <clears throat> so some people ask me now, what are these hoppers good for? They have never heard about them and they ask me, what are they good for? Uh, well, they are maybe not the center of the universe, but they are in the middle of a complicated and, and diverse web of other users, of other organisms which depend on them or which are utilized, uh, starting with the birds and the bats and amphibians which uh, eat them. And there are also invertebrate predators, there are parasitoids, there are honeydew consumers, there are fungi, there are the host plants and, and so on. And there is also a, 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 the soil, of course, which interacts with them. And there are numerous types of interaction ranging from intra predation uh, to, to release from predators and, paras and uh, parasitoids and so on. Competition, uh, some uh, uh, leafhoppers are tended by, by ants and they give, they give honeydew to the ants. And this has other uh, uh, effects on the soil, for instance. It's a really complicated thing. And uh, what happens if you now cut the host plant? If you cut the host plant, this whole system is, is reduced just by, by the mere biomass, because there is no more biomass left to the plants. And all these, uh, these three or four or, or even more trophic levels are reduced, <clears throat> causing a bottleneck. And uh, it also means that uh, even after regrowth of the meadow, uh, the insects are dead. The insects cannot recover as quickly as the grass or as the other plants, because um, after cutting, there is uh, the sun would shine on these meadows and most of the grass is, is taken away with eggs and so on. So uh, there is a strong reduction of biodiversity after cutting. Now we take a, we, we consider a side issue, another side issue, the great losers on the meadow encompass, encompass these birds it is uh, the two buster species, both, both of which were common in Central Europe about until 200 years ago. It is the short-toed eagle. It is this little owl. It is three kinds of shrikes. There is also the great gray shrike, which is not on this, uh, on this picture. This one, the lesser gray shrike, I think it is. It is now extinct in Germany. Also, this one is also extinct. The roller is extinct in Germany uh, and so on. Also, uh, the, the griffin vulture, which, which bred in Germany until, I think, 16 or 700 or something. Uh, and also this kind of small sparrow bred until the, the 20th century. All these birds were uh, uh, bred on the former pastures, and most of them are now gone, and many of them even extinct all over Central Europe. And these are the next candidates. In Germany, we call them meadow birds, Wiesenbrüter. Um, and we assume that they would breed, that they would breed on mown meadows. This is why we call them meadow birds. But in fact, uh, they just need more time. This is my interpretation. Uh, they are not real meadow birds, but they just need more time until they get exterminated by us conservationists by a wrong uh, management. It's a bit uh, provocating, but uh, <laughs> I leave it here as a statement. Uh, coming back, coming back to the to the to the language thing, uh, we we call these birds uh, Wiesenbrüter, meadow breeders, and then we believe we can only manage them by meadow management. But this is probably not true. In Spanish, we have the term aves pasticiales, and in Dutch, uh, the Dutch call them weidevogels. So in this case, we can state that language determines thinking. There is another collateral damage of mowing. It is the loss of seeds. It is the landscape-wide loss of seeds. This paper came out uh, two years ago by, by colleagues from the Leipzig uh, uh, IDIF, and it showed three groups of birds on the left-hand side. 
the omnivores, then insectivores, and the seed eaters. And the result the authors expected was that the insectivores, the insectivore birds, decreased more <coughs> than uh, omnivore birds. But in fact, it was the seed eaters that decreased even more than the insect feeders. So this came as a surprise, and the authors didn't stress it much. But to me, uh, it is not much surprising because that because these seed eaters decrease so strongly because there are no more seeds in the landscape. Flowers and plants, which are cut all the time, they cannot bloom anymore, and uh, they cannot, of course, uh, uh, made, make uh, fruits anymore on seeds. So it is the partridge and the goldfinch and the linnet and the house sparrow and the tree sparrow, which decline even more than the insect feeding birds. So what else happens uh, from these mown grasslands? Uh, there are only few insects that go up into the air. This means that swifts and swallows and bats, all those um, animals which feed on insects in the air, would decrease. And also starling and skylark and yellow emma, they decrease. And I would really say that the silent spring has come true. This is, for instance, uh, this diagram shows a dramatic bird decline in Germany only within the last 12 years. It shows that the starling alone has decreased for uh, more than a million breeding pairs. And also other common birds are here. This is the yellow emmer and the sparrows and the, the, uh, the chaffinch and so on. So after this uh, pessimistic look, we go for a holiday. And we go, for, we go to Southern Europe or we go to, to Romania or we go to Mongolia, maybe to Greece, to Southern France, to Spain. And what do we see? We walk, we hike through this kind of landscape where we can see this, this, this bull here and this horse. And there are all these animals which have become extinct in our own country. And there are, there are these piles of dung with, with uh, grasshoppers and with rare, rare beetles and with rare butterflies. And uh, there is this eagle and there is even the waldrop. Um, and these are all uh, the, the, the species we lost. And after we come back from our holidays, we continue mowing in our own uh, reserves. So my hypothesis is a bit provocating. I would say that the all over loss of free roaming livestock on our pre-industrial pastures with machines, uh, against machines is perhaps the most integrative, integrative explanation for the loss of our, bio, of our bio, biodiversity. And this is also true in many managed nature reserves. So this rich biomass of all tropic levels has turned into these small amounts which remain after mowing, after constant mowing of 200 years. And we all know that pesticides have, have been discussed as a major uh, factor for this loss, but I believe that pesticides, which are which are mainly uh, brought out on fields, uh, would perhaps not have too much effects on on grasslands, which are uh, which are far away from them. And actually, we don't have the data. We don't have uh, really good studies which prove that that pesticides pesticides which have uh, been brought out on fields would have an effect in faraway uh, grasslands and nature reserves. Another case study now uh, from the other side. This is uh, about two newly created pastures in Germany. The one here in, in Thuringia shows the, the number of spawn bales of the grass frog uh, in, the early, in the 10 years after creating that pastures. You can see that in 2004, there was almost nothing. Um, so it is, it is uh, a few ponds, and there is a, a huge pasture around of se several hundred hectares. And you can see that after 12 years, in the 12th year, uh, this, the number has increased to over 2,000 bales. So you can imagine, in every bale, there might be about 1,000 young frogs. Uh, when these frogs come out to the pasture, 
uh, you cannot make any step without without trampling a few of them. Uh, and this is what happened when there is no when there is mowing, no mowing. And this is a place here, the Bingenheimer Ried in, in Hess, in, also in central Germany, about 100 hectares, which are grazed since about 1985. And we have amphibian numbers, which are incredibly high. We have about uh, 5,000 uh, Pelobatis fuscus. We have about 25 calling Bufo viridis, and the same number of Bufo calamita, a tree frog, common tree frog, Hula arborea, about 1,000 calling and about 10,000 uh, Triturus uh, cristalus. It is a uh, crested nude, I think. Huge numbers of amphibians. And we also had a, a bird species, Porzana pusilla, which has been, which was extinct for more than 100 years in that federal state. And it started breeding again after more than 100 years. Another example of a, of a great success is the uh, Cuxhavener Küstenheide. It's about a, a 350 hectare area where they started grazing in 2006. And after only seven years, the number of breeding uh, uh, Ziegenmelke, it is uh, Nightjar, Capimulgus Europeus, uh, doubled. And the, the number of red bat shrike, Lanius colurio, uh, increased fourfold. Woodlark, Lulula arborea, difficult to say, increased threefold, and so on. Here there are two species which have become extremely rare all over Germany. The one is the Winchat, Saxicola um, rubetra, and the wheat ear, Ernante Ernante. They both uh, established a new after 2006. So they immigrated new and they still increased quite substantially. Or here the linnet increased four or five fold. So we have a strong increase after only very few years. Or another example, this is uh, a former forest which was which was uh, where they uh, took out a number of trees and which were which were which was grazed during the last 10 years and we had within only eight years we had an increase of red list species of red list bird species of north rhine westphalia from eight breeding pairs to 135 including tree pipit antus trivialis uh, woodlark again Lulula arborea, or here, uh, Ficedula hypoloica. Uh, don't remember the English name. Phoenicus, Phoenicus red start, zero to eight. Five of these species just immigrated and increased dramatically. And we also have breeding attempts of that small uh, owl, sparrow owl, or again, I don't remember the name, uh, Glaucidium passerinum. Caprimulgus europeus uh, tried to breed. And also there was a snake, a rare snake species, Coronella austriaca, um, a, a lizard, Lazzetta agilis, and Grillus campestris, which made their way into, into that forest patch, which was formerly uh, completely free of all these species. There is also an explosion of orchid diversity. Unfortunately, again, only in German, but uh, I try to explain the numbers. This is uh, Orchis Militaris. It established a new from 0 to 30, 32 individuals within only six years. This is a, a rare species of, of Ophris, Ophris spegodis, I think, uh, established after nine years and increased uh, or I would skip this one, Orchis tridentata, by the way. And this is a, a species, Chimantoglossum hyacinum, that was extinct in, in, in the whole federal state of Saxony-Anhalt. And it reappeared only after four years of grazing and is still increasing. Now, I'm leaving the field of biodiversity and going to uh, climate change. <clears throat> uh, and I would like to demonstrate the soil as a carbon sink, the soil as a neglected uh, 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 site as a neglected carbon sink, which because most people consider only trees as carbon sinks. We have here the, the amount of carbon here for all Europe and here the other continents. Just for Europe, we have a relatively small amount of carbon stored in trees. 
but we have a much larger amount of carbon in uh, in the soil stored as, as humus in the soil. This means that soils are potentially are potentially more important carbon sinks than trees, than forests. And this is also true for other continents, uh, not so much for South America and Africa, where there are many uh, large open places, but for Europe, it is definitely the case. Uh, we all know that, ag that agriculture emits 7% of greenhouse gases through non-sustainable land use. This includes plowing of grassland, lost humus, mineral fertilizer, industrial livestock, farming, uh, and use of machines. <clears throat> so uh, through changing of the land use, we might bring back much more uh, carbon into the soil. And this graph shows the distribution of carbon worldwide in, in different uh, biomes. And you can readily see that the box, wetlands and box, uh, store the largest amount of carbon, 657 billion tons, billions of tons of carbon in a very small area, only 6.2 uh, million square kilometers. So the box are certainly the most important uh, carbon store, but, uh, we are now in grassland. Uh, in grassland, we have we have an approximately similar area size, but we have a larger amount of carbon stored in the humus than uh, compared to forests. So uh, the the grassland should be taken much more into account when we talk about climate change and about saving of the climate. And I want to point out uh, a very nice book and a very interesting and well-written book. It is only German. It has been translated now to Spanish and hopefully it will also be translated to English by a colleague and much appreciated friend of mine, Anita Edel. And the title is The Cow is Not a Climate Killer. And this book treats uh, the mistreated cow, the nowadays mistreated cow with a monstrous udder, which is chained in small stable and fed with concentrated and natural, unnatural food mainly soy and maize, and uh, the production of which, the production of that food, which burdens the global climate because it is produced in Brazil and in other countries where forests are cut down. And in contrast, see, the author propagates the cow on an adequate site with an uh, adequate stocking density, which maintains the soil fertility and which stabilizes the climate. <clears throat> We have more uh, problems in our ecosystems. We have uh, many flooding events, maybe not during the last three years, but these are flooding. These photos, photographs were taken in 2002 and 2013, where we had massive problems in, in uh, several river valleys in Germany. <clears throat> and I want to, to point out a paper which was written by, by uh, another appreciated colleague, Edgar Reisinger, in 20. 19, and he suggests a subsidy program uh, termed transformation of fields into low intensity grassland in floodplains and other wetlands. So we have uh, we have a huge area of fields of arable fields in our river uh, valleys, and these river valleys are flooded frequently, and the soil is washed away, and we have the problem of, of flooding events further down the river where there are large cities. Which have a real problem when we when we when we have uh, a strong rain. And uh, uh, Mr. Reisinger states that the damage of flooding alone in 2002 and 2013 in Germany was uh, about 18 billions of euro. And he demands a permanent cessation of agriculture on this area. Uh, and this would include, for instance, 250,000 hectares of what we call HQ100. I didn't find, sorry, I didn't find a, a term in English. It, this means, HQ100 means uh, those areas which are flooded at least once in 100 years. We also have an HQ10, which means uh, an area flooded in at least in 10 years. And uh, this is essentially, uh, it is fields where the, the economic loss 
for the whole society overweighs the economic gain for the farmer through this flooding event. And these 250,000 hectares should be grazed extensively, if possible, uh, year round, uh, at a maximum stocking density of 0 0.8 livestock units per hectare. And also, dikes and drainages, all dikes and drainages should be removed. This means that we would give back the river more flooding, more flooding uh, space. And no fertilizers should be used and no pesticides. And the total subsidy uh, the, the, the farmer would get should be around 1,700 euro per hectare for 20 years. And after 20 years, he will only get the normal subsidy. And this program could attract uh, uh, farmers to change that program. And it would cost us only 425 millions per year. This would make up only 8.5 billions in 20 years. So it would not be a program that would be very expensive, but you would take this money out of the, the normal uh, uh, subsidy uh, pot of the European Union. Uh, it should just be spent in another way than we spend it today. And there should be another, uh, another program, another subsidy program, termed near natural permanent pasture with cattle and horses. It could also be made for, for water buffalo and preferably a year-round grazing and a low stocking density, 0 0.1 to 0 0.8 livestock units. Um, additional feeding only when necessary, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't import much nitrogen into these places. And of course, fertilizers and pesticides and prophylactic medicals against parasites should be banned. And no machines should be used. And here we would demand as a total subsidy of maybe 700 to 1,000 euro per hectare. And again, this is not money we would have, to, we would have to, to spend up new, but it is money taken from the first and second pillar of the European uh, Union. And of course, we would have to spend money for the construction of fences and corals. And these two programs would make up a huge gain for nature, for environment, for climate, for tourism, and for recreation as a whole. So we would demand an agenda for the European Union, a term in the agricultural policy, 3.0, and this would, uh, we would, we would make the cow, we should make the cow, the happy cow, on a low intensity pasture, a top issue, and protect biodiversity, climate, landscape, soils, environment, and men, including the farmers. And we should ask whether European agriculture needs to produce meat with imported fodder for the whole world, which we import now everywhere to China and elsewhere, but leave the waste, uh, the waste as a slurry in our own country. And we should also explain customers that the current agricultural policy betrays and forsakes actually our landscape and homeland, feeding them with cheap stuff, the true price of which they will pay uh, through taxes for subsidies and uh, reparations. So regarding its huge implications, this turn could be a great target for the whole society. And this is how we, how, what we propagate uh, as modern grazing landscapes. We would have these, these uh, unregulated, again, unregulated unre river systems with an open landscapes with shrubs and, uh, and unchanneled rivers with a lot of birds and animals and other stuff. So the take home message, if we can manage to bring out the underestimated cow from the stable back to the pasture under these prescribed conditions, we will get back our lost insects and birds and much more. We will protect the climate, we will manage uh, flood control, protect our soils from erosion, reduce eutrophication and pesticide use. We would promote animal welfare, produce high quality meat, we would support traditional farmers, we would keep our landscape and homeland, and we would produce balsam for our stressed urban souls. And for this, in order to achieve this goal, we need 5% of the open and forested land, but these can be the least productive sites. It can be the poorest so soils, the driest soils. It can be floodplains, which are, which are flooded every few years. And from the point of national economy, this would cost us peanuts. It would just 
uh, it would just need money that we spend anyway, but for other purposes. So thank you. This was my talk. So thank you, thank you very much, Herbert. This talk it was super, super interesting. And now I believe there will be a lot of questions concerning this. But uh, before that, I would just like to uh, invite you to uh, next <coughs> to a uh, next talk uh, that we will be organizing uh, through this fluorescent chinos online talks. Uh, it will be about insects from uh, Michal Mikat and uh, other entomologists, and it will be about uh, about bees and not the traditional bees, but also about solitary bees. Uh, it will be in Czech, however. And if you want to, uh, if you want to join uh, those other talks, then just let uh, someone of us know or type the fluorescent knots into the Google, and we'll find it. So, uh, thank you again, Herbert. And uh, now, if there are any questions, uh, please turn on your microphone and speak up, or just write it in the chat. So, any questions? Mm. I think if there are uh, no questions, at least so far, then maybe I would ask. Um, I think this uh, uh, this approach, uh, we, we don't really see this in Czech Republic. We don't really see, any, I think, any pastures much. And the grazing, I think, is, uh, is uh, considered a good thing when it's extensive. Uh, but do, do you think that uh, this kind of a... I would call it patchy uh, mowing, which you only mow a part of the meadow, and the other one you let it unmown at all, and then you mow it, for example, uh, the other year or something like that. Do you think it is uh, at least slightly better for the biodiversity than the classical mowing, uh, or is it just you know the same bad? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question and a question that is asked very often <laughs> and well people believe people try actually to imitate the cow by 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 uh, by making a patchy mowing regime you know uh, if you do this very patchy i think you can be quite successful but you don't have the dung and uh, normally just for for reasons of capacity uh, your your powers will be very limited. Normally, what, what is normally done is that they mow one hectare on the one side, and on the other side they they let they they let uh, they let one hectare uh, untouched. Yeah, uh, but even at that small size, it would probably not be possible, at least not for leaf hoppers, of a of a whole hectare uh, emigrating from that mown hectare to the other hectare. And this is even questionable on 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 strips on fla on on uh, grassland strips which are left on a on a breadth of maybe ten meters. I think grasshoppers are quite capable of doing that of changing, but probably not not leaf hoppers and not uh, insects which which are strictly bound to their host plant. Yeah. I know that there are some reserves where they where they mow really one square meter here and one square meter there. Uh, but this can simply, for, for reasons of capacity, it cannot be done on a, on a larger scale. And once more, you don't have the time. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I can see that now Petr Šipek uh, also has a question. So please uh, turn off your microphone and ask. Okay, thank you, uh, Herbert, very much for your talk. Uh, unfortunately, I came in a bit late, but uh, but I see uh, I saw your topic is ex extremely interesting for me as we are doing some some research on insect decline, mainly on uh, commercial uh, commercial meadows or hay production meadows. So my question is, um, if you think that there are any uh, uh, ways how to save the production, uh, uh, the insects of the production meadows, if there are at least some uh, compensations, uh, as uh, Shimon already asked, some um, uh, possibilities like uh, strip mowing or, or, or things like this. If this 
uh, will even pay off for its totally sc uh, scrap because what we see on the meadows here in Czech Republic the they are really uh, the production meadows are really really species poor yeah thank you <clears throat> yeah it's true that that the productive meadows are really poor and you have you have contrasting demands you have contrasting demands for instance from from botanists who who want uh, certain places to to be cut more often and you cannot make a, a cutting regime for all groups of species what you can do is to 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 postpone uh, the cut until late summer or even autumn uh, but this cannot probably be done on on more or less productive uh, meadows you can leave uh, flower strips uh, uh, um, um, fallow strips and you can leave you can leave uh, patches, maybe whole hectare or something like that. If this is possible, uh, you can leave as much fallow as possible for for saving insects' lives. But I know that that uh, outside it is difficult to implement that. Yeah, the, the people are strongly against this. The Ministry of uh, of um, uh, Agriculture is strongly opposed yeah. any 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 things like this. Thank there you. is one more point that you could do uh, is mowing not as deep as you usually do mowing mm -hmm. at the at the height of about 10 centimeters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of course most animals most insects are, are quite down are quite near the ground and if you put the, the the blades higher you would save a lot of insects definitely okay good point thank you Other questions? Okay, so uh, I think that there are no more questions. I can see correctly. So thank you very much once again, and okay. see you soon.